Hallelujah. God bless you so much. Welcome to this segment of our ministry. We're actually talking things that anybody can actually be part of, no matter how old you are. Even if you have somebody that's bald-headed like I am, you are actually candidate for what we're dealing with. So I want to invite you to invite a friend, whoever they are, wherever they are, because what we're talking is quite deep. It's not for children. It's just that we call this the youth edition of our ministry. So I want to begin to talk to us today about the principles of foundation, the principles of foundation. I want to begin to talk to us about deep foundational factors in our lives the things that can actually explain exactly where we are, what's going on in our lives, and why what is going on is going on. You need to begin to get suspicious about what's going on in your life because if it's negative, you want to ask yourself, when is it going to be positive? What will stop it? When will it stop? But it's extremely important for everybody that's here present, everybody that's listening to me, wherever you are, you need to begin to ask yourself, what is going on in my life and what has caused it? When will it stop? Will it stop by itself or it has to be stopped? That's where you begin to probe foundational factors to look at some of the things that your life has been made of so that you begin to see why certain things are going on in your life the way they are going on. So I want to talk about the principles of foundation. And I want to begin to talk about your personal foundational factors. So I want everybody that's listening, if you're writing any notes, get that in your spirit. Your personal foundation. I'm not talking about somebody else. I'm, not, I'm talking about you. So I wanted to get this, get to personalize it, and begin to look at your life surgically. I'm giving you a surgeon's knife so you can get a cut your life deep in the inside and find out exactly what your life is made of and why certain things are going on in your life. Now, one of the most important things that everybody here present must understand is that everything that is made has a foundation. That's the first place that it would be right for me to begin. Everything that is created has a foundation. The foundation is a base. It is a base from which everything that is made is built. In fact, in all building processes, you will always find that when a builder is building anything, they will always lay the foundation before they do the building. That is true with the tiniest of all things. It is true with the tallest building. There is always the foundation before the building is done. It is a base from which building takes place. Very important. And so for the building to come to the place of fulfillment of its destiny, if you allow me to use that word, it's going to be necessary that the foundation is actually laid correctly. Because foundation is also a base of support. Am I speaking to somebody already? If you look at all of the things that man has created, everything that man makes, the first primary thing about everything man makes is that it has purpose. That is important. Man makes nothing for nothing. Everybody that's going to wake up tomorrow is going to be Monday. Everybody that's going to wake up tomorrow to go to work is going to be doing something for something. Nothing is done for nothing. You cannot find anybody that is busy trying to build something and you ask him, what are you doing that for? He says, nothing. <laughs> Hallelujah. There will always be purpose. Always purpose presents itself before the idea for what you're going to make. Let me put it better. Before anybody can think of what they want to make, they will always be confronted with the problem for which this product is going to be a solution. I want to say that until you get it. Until you begin to think, wait, before God created me, there was something I was coming to sort. Because nothing is made for nothing. It takes a foolish builder to build something for nothing. And I'm going to tell you, no builder is that foolish. Everything that somebody gets to spend time to build is always for a purpose. And the purpose presents itself in the form of a problem or a need that needs solution. And so when somebody begins to 
think of what they should make. They're thinking in regards to the problem that needs solution. And so the idea that they get concerning what they're going to build to take care of the problem, that product is going to be for the purpose of taking care of the problem at hand. That is how you need to think. Hallelujah. And the moment you begin to build whatever it is that you want to build to take care of whatever it is that you're taking care of that is a problem, you will always begin with foundation. Everything that is built, you will always start with the base that the product is going to be built off of. The foundation is the platform from which something is built. When you look at your lives, this far you have been built. And I can tell you with an assurance and audacity that you have been built off a foundation. That's important. There is nothing that is built without a foundation. There must be a foundation before the building project begins to happen. So that then begins to make you want to ask yourself, okay, so what I've been made of then I've actually been made off of a foundation. Could the foundation be responsible for where I am, what I am, what's going on in my life? That is a good question if you ask yourself. And so that's why you begin to ask yourself, what is it that caused what I'm going through right now, what I'm experiencing, what's going on in my life? Could there be a foundation? And that's why you want to begin to probe some of the things that you clearly know has nothing to do with God. There are things going on in your life that have everything to do with God. There are things that have nothing to do with God. And you want to ask yourself, how did you access my life? How did you get me here? What gave you the audacity? What gave you the foundation? That's where foundation then becomes very, very important. Is that making sense to everybody that's listening to me? So foundation is extremely important. It's a base of support. It's a base, a platform from which everything is built. Now, I'm going to go a little deeper. That is true concerning man's life. Man's life must have a foundation because of a couple of things. Number one, living is the process of journeying. Every human being has a journey of life. Hallelujah. Everybody that you know has been journeying and is journeying. And you too are journeying. You journey. To a place of destiny. Now the journey has two significant principles. I'm going to go a little deeper at some point. And one of the principles concerning every journey is the journey has the starting. That is actually what the foundation is. The foundation is the starting. Very important. But the journey also has the finish. So let me begin with the finish. Then I will wind up with the starting. Is that okay? The finish is the destiny. In other words, journey is started and it is a process towards a destination. What is destination is what we call destiny. Hallelujah. That's why you find people like Paul in the book of 2 Timothy chapter number 4, verse number 6 to 7. Paul, the apostle, speaks this word. He said, the time has come for my departure. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Now is awaiting me the crown of glory that God will reward to, to me and to everybody that lives faithful, that journeys faithfully. The thing that I want to see is Paul says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Paul has come to the end of the journey of life. And he looks back. And he sees a journey covered that has had a lot of processes, but now he has reached, successfully reached the destination. Not everybody does. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you still there? So let me begin with the destination, the finish, before I get to the start, the foundation. The finish, when you come to this life, there are Things that are destinational factors. I want you to first of all get to understand that you are a human being. And a human being is a spirit that has been given a body and a soul to live here for a purpose and for a time. Your living here is a timed project. Doesn't matter who you are. 
I, I've, I've been seeing some programs on the television where there are some kings of old that were mummified and some of them were buried in something that looked so palatial. The, the, the corpse was even given some kind of compartment, right? Because they really wanted to live longer than they did. So somewhere, even when they're dying, they're giving that instruction to people to get to design the grave in such a way that it looks like a perpetuation of living on the earth. But the reality is they died. <laughs> they became history. And the reason is because every human being is a spirit that's been given a body to live here, a body and a soul to live here for a time and for a purpose. Never forget that. You live here for a time. You are not perpetual. You are not somebody that's going to live here all your days. That's why you want to be careful with your time. That's, how, that's why you want to be careful what you do with your life. Because there's going to come a time when you realize the end factors will be calling and saying, now the bell is ringing. The trumpet call is saying, get thee out of that body and get into the realm of eternity. Everybody, you could be born in a palace, no matter where you're born, you could be born to wealth beyond measure. The reality is you're timed. Doesn't matter who you are, you are timed. Hallelujah. But when you are brought to this side of time to live as a human being, a spirit that has been given a soul and a body to live as a human being, then your living process becomes a journeying process. I think that's better introduction. Hallelujah. It becomes a journeying process. And every journey has the starting factors and it has the finishing factors. And the finish is destination or destiny. Right? Hallelujah. At the close of your life, if you arrived at the right destiny, you should have fulfilled the purpose of your life. I want to say that again. At the close of your life, when, if, when you've journeyed correctly and you've come to the right destiny, you should have finished and fulfilled the purpose of your life. One of the most scary things are eternal factors. That the Bible echoes that all of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account on what we did or how we lived in this body. Everybody will stand before <laughs> the judgment seat of Christ. On that side where you are not in charge. <laughs> you know, humanity has gone to a place where we, we even want to feel like we need to tell God, you stay on your side of the line. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? This outside, but I gotta tell you, everybody has a destination. Everybody has this predestination that there will come a moment that you will come out of this body, you will come out of this body, and you will get to a, a realm where your will does not matter. You will get to a realm where you're no longer going to be working. You're going to get to a realm where your responsibilities are no longer the responsibilities you had here. Now all that you have to do is accountability. That's what makes somebody want to live carefully. Hello, young people. That's what makes you want to live carefully. You want to be, don't want to be careless because there's going to be a moment you're going to stand before the judgment seat of the creator that made you. And you're going to give account on how you lived here. While you are here, what you say it, how you say it, to whom you say it, <laughs> and about whom you say it. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. That's why you want to be careful. So if you journeyed correctly through this journey of life, if you journeyed correctly by the close of your life, when you reach that destination, you should have fulfilled purpose. That is true destiny that God intended for you to have. Where your purpose is fulfilled. When every task that God had ever given to you is fulfilled. The reason why you were given life is fulfilled. By the way, purpose is the reason for life. Everything that is created is given life. And it's given life to fulfill the reason 
why it's given life. That is what purpose is. That's why the moment you stop fulfilling purpose, you cease to have the right to life. Right to life is not given by legal fraternity. It's given by the giver of life itself who gave life for a purpose. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You'll be shocked to discover how many people are breathing that don't have a right to life from the giver of life. Because they have no regard for the purpose for which they were given life. Because purpose is, life is given for purpose. Are you still there? Are you still listening to what I'm saying in here? Whoever you are there, God bless you so much. Hallelujah. When you have journeyed correctly, when you reach the place of destiny, you should have fulfilled your spiritual responsibility because man is given a spirit and that spirit is given to you for significant purpose. Every part and every component of man's life has a purpose. God gives us a spirit for several purposes. One of the purposes for which God gives man a spirit is so that you may establish sound relationship with God. That's important. You're given a spirit to build relationship with God Almighty. Given a spirit to fulfill that requirement of building relationship with God. And you need to build such sound relationship with God that it affects somebody. You need to build such sound relationship with God that it becomes generational. There are people that build such beautiful relationship with God. Their children had no otherwise but to build relationship with God. You, you, you have a beautiful relationship that you hand over to your children. Covenant relationship at the time that you're leaving, God is relating to your children as well. God has your children as his because you handed them over to God Almighty through the relationship that, that you built with God. That is what we're talking about. It should be a kind of relationship that goes beyond your lifetime. That's why the Bible talks about a people like Abraham. But Abraham is called by God as the friend of God. He built a relationship that outlives him. Long since dead, but God gives a testimony about Abraham. And he calls him Abraham, my friend. Hallelujah. David built such a beautiful relationship with God that the echoes of God's testimony is that David is a man after God's own heart. So you'll find in the book of Acts chapter number 13, verse number 22, that God gives a testimony about David. And he said, I found in David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do whatever I want. And I pray that everybody that's listening to me will desire to become the David in your generation. All these people that God spoke about are people that are long since dead. Now it is your time to be a David. The man after God's own heart. The woman after God's own heart that God testifies about. It's not about you writing a song about it and saying, I am a man after God's own heart. No, it's not David who sang a song. It is God who sang a song concerning David. Hallelujah. It is not Abraham who told people, I've been a friend of God. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm talking about? I've been a friend of God. It's not Abraham who began to tell everybody, excuse me, I'm a friend of God. No, it is God who wrote a song concerning Abraham and he sang about Abraham and he called him Abraham, my friend. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But now Abraham has died. Now it's your turn to become the friend of God. My point is simple. By the time of his death, he had built such a relationship with God. He used his spirit to build such a relationship with God that becomes perpetual. It becomes generational. Hallelujah. You are successful when your success succeeds. That is the principle. So whatever your destiny is, that destiny must touch the next generation. That's why even when your purpose is fulfilled, that purpose flows to the next generation. That's why when you look in the scripture, you actually find purposes that God gave people but were fulfilled in the lives of descendants. Hello. 
And God called Abram, for example. He spoke to Abram. And he said, leave your country, your people, and your father's household. Go to the land I will show you. And he said, I will make you into a great nation. There is no nation on earth that is called Abram. God was speaking about the nation being fulfilled in the life and time of his grandson that would be called Israel. Hallelujah. So God called him to purpose, but that was going to be inherited by his grandson. You are not fulfilled until the purpose you came for is so fulfilled, it flows to the next generation. It becomes a mantle that somebody can carry on to the next level. A mantle that has touched somebody's life so deeply that it becomes the mantle they live for. Hallelujah. And that is true with your spirituality. When you truly develop great spiritual destiny, that you have had a beautiful relationship with God, that relationship should touch the next generation. Your descendants must come to the place where they love God so desperately because of the kind of relationship that you built with God. Am I speaking to somebody? Because you are not successful until your successor succeeds. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God gave you the spirit so that by your spirit you may establish priesthood. We're going to talk about priesthood at some point because everybody must come to the place where you understand that God gave everybody divine assignment. Everybody has a divine assignment. All of you listening to me right now and everybody that's watching right now, everybody has divine assignment given to you by God Almighty. God saying, I called you for a purpose. I created you for a divine purpose. This is your task on earth. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Your spirit must come to the place where it established priesthood. And that priesthood is a destiny. And it's not great destiny. It's not successful destiny until it becomes priesthood the next generation can feel. Until my sons and my daughters get to the place where they feel my heart and they want to carry what I carry. I don't consider myself successful. Your priesthood must be felt by the next generation. Somebody might get, must get the fire of your passion and carry that fire in their lifetime. Praise God. That's priesthood. Very, very important. Your spirit was given so that by it you may win spiritual battles. There are battles in this life that are not physical. No matter how much muscle you have, they will bring you down if you do not have spiritual muscle. And that's why Paul wants us in the book of Ephesians chapter number 6. And I pray that everybody listening to me understand that you have battles to win. And he says, finally, brethren, verse number 10 to 13, finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Every time that somebody tells you to be strong, they are warning you that there's a battle that's going to come. So he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. Then he says, put on the full armor of God. Every time that somebody tells you to put on armor, armor is a set of weapons. He says, put on the full armor of God. In other words, take the set of weapons, not the weapons of man, but the weapons of God. Hallelujah. So that you may stand, take a stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. And then he goes on in verse number 12. says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You must understand what the principalities are. Because if you wrestle against them, then I think it's important that you define your opponent. If you're in a wrestling match and you're wrestling with someone whose strength you don't know, whose makeup you don't know, they will bring you down. doesn't matter who you are. So when you hear the echoes in the Bible that God said, we wrestle against principalities. You need to ask yourself, what are these? Hallelujah. Wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers and the powers of this dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, Paul says that there is a realm that is called the heavenly realms and there are spiritual forces of evil in such realms. And these forces engage us in a wrestling battle. Hallelujah. And if you lose that battle, 
There is always a consequence. How many of you have lost a battle somewhere? Maybe an argument. Maybe you were staked up somewhere in the midst of other young people and somebody kind of brought in some kind of argument and you stumbled and you actually kind of stumbled and eventually everybody laughed at you. You understand what I'm saying? All right? And you left that place feeling intimidated. Am I right? And feeling stigmatized. Now when you meet the same group that you were in the midst of where somebody kind of debated you out, you actually feel smaller. And the reason why you feel smaller is because you lost the battle. That's exactly what happens. So when you get to understand that there are things that are called spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm that engage you in battle, then you should pay attention. You don't see them, but they wrestle against you. One of the most amazing realities is the place where Paul takes that from. In the days of the Roman colony, over Israel and those nations in that region. There used to be a culture in which they used to have wrestling matches, matches in, in what they call the Roman Colosseum. I got it right this time, did I? Son, did I get it right? Thank you. Yeah, I was corrected. I, I used to say uh, another word that, the, that you guys don't like. And I'm trying to conform to your generation, you understand. Yeah, because, because. So, and in that wrestling match, what used to happen is the match was not over until the person that was defeated was killed. I've seen a reenactment of that in a movie. I'm not a movie person, but I just saw a clip of it. And in that clip, the person that was defeated, lying helplessly on the floor, unable to get back on his feet, the opponent who defeated him took a sword and drove it down his chest until he was dead. Because the battle was not over until the defeated person was dead. That's what Paul is bringing all of this from. The moment you understand that the principalities and the powers and the spiritual forces that wrestle against you have this determination that the, the battle is not over. Until one person is dead, you can't afford to lose that battle. You understand that if they engage you regarding marriage, they are not going to stop until your marriage of future is completely dead and buried. That's why as young people, you want to begin to look at your relational factors. And you want to begin to find out what are these things going on in my body. Ladies, girls, you begin to ask yourself, what are these things going on in my womb? Could something be determined to make me barren? You need to begin to ask yourself that. Could this be natural? Could this be spiritual? Could this be something that I need to wage war against? Because something is determined to make sure that by the time that I get married, I don't have a womb. The things that you could be going through that have nothing to do with physicality. They're not physical things. They're spiritual forces wrestling against you to make sure that in an area of life you are dead. If they take up your financial life, they will never rest until they make sure that you lie flat, dead, in poverty, unable to become anything in this life. Hallelujah. Take up your professional life, your career life. They will make sure that you will never get to do what you knew you were supposed to do in this life. That's where Paul is coming from. Hallelujah. And your destiny is not arrived at until you've won all the battles spiritually and you've completely defeated all the foes that engaged you up in battle. Am I speaking to somebody? That's why when Paul comes to the end of his life, he says, I have fought the good fight and I have finished the race. He's standing at the closing line, the finish line. And he has a confession that he has fought. And the reason why he's come to finish successful is because in the battles that he fought, he was not flawed. Let me tell you something, beloved. And you have the advantage of youth. Hallelujah. Even you right there. Got the advantage of youth. Praise God. 
Amen. You must get to understand that you have the advantage of youth. You can change things now and grow to become the greatest person possible. Several times when somebody is old, old people don't have time. Old people, you meet somebody that in their 80s, probably they just got some 10 years. You meet somebody in 15 years of age, they got 85 years. Wow. You got time on your side. Don't lose it. If you lose it, you're losing your life because your time is your life. Hallelujah. Praise God. There's a point that I'm trying to drive home here and I pray that you can get. That living is the process of journeying to destiny and every journey has the starting and the finishing. And I decided to start with the finishing before I come to the starting. Praise God. The finishing is destiny. And you are successfully journeyed in life and come to the right destination when you have come to the right spiritual destiny. The right spiritual destiny means you have won all battles that were waged up against you. Hallelujah. That's what spiritual destiny means. You've won all battles that were waged up against you. Some of the battles you're going through or that you will ever go through are not just targeting you. They're targeting your generations. Targeting your descendants. Something that wants to conquer you so they would get to access your child. Because whatever gets to conquer a father gets to access the child. Hallelujah. And that's why you must get into battle. That's why you have to build spiritual capacity. Because you live in a world where the battles you fight are spiritual. When you understand that, you want to build spiritual capacity. Even if you don't know how to pray, you're going to just be saying, ma, 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 until you find it. You can't afford to be the prayerless person because prayer is the exercise of the spirit. Hallelujah. Nobody becomes great in the kingdom of God without a prayer line. Neither can you. Glory to God. When you truly come to a successful destiny in this journey of life, you should have established marital fullness. According to God who created marriage, marriage is not successful until the two have become one. God said in the book of Genesis 2 and verse number 24, is saying it, for this reason, the man shall leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one until the two have become one. According to God, that marriage was never successful. Do you get what I'm saying? And your marriage is not successful. You've not come to marriage or destiny until the two have become one. Hallelujah. And that is what brings marriage to success that becomes generational. I'm going to tell you that everything that is a success in a parent's life flows to the next generation. That is the agenda of God. Many of us are struggling in regards to marriage because nobody in the background of our lives ever fought for us. We had parents that never valued marriage. We had grandparents that never valued marriage. Nobody ever bothered to establish marriage so that the next generation could be able to have great marriages. So you try this relationship, it breaks. And you try that, it breaks. And you don't even know what marriage is. Don't even know how to be a husband because your father was never a husband. Getting what I'm saying? He never presented anything to you that would model up your life and help you be able to grow to become a great husband. Mother was never a good wife. And so she never left you with anything that you would emulate. So if you're going to become a great, smart woman and smart wife, you're going to have to probably kind of go to Google or something like that. I, I pray that, that, that the Google Bible. Hallelujah. Praise God. It is not a success by the time of your life, the end of your life comes, unless it becomes generational. Until it flows to the next generation, you have never reached the desired destiny in life. 
That's why it doesn't matter how old you are, you keep on working hard because you want to make sure that you leave something behind. Glory to God. Because there's something that must be inherited in the next generation. So no matter what struggle that you have, you want to make sure that you struggle until you succeed. Somebody say amen. You want to make sure that you stop crying and start trying. Glory to God. You are not successful by the time that you reach your destination until, until you have come to financial destiny. Again, when we talk about the journey of life, you're journeying towards a place of financial or economic destiny. Again, when you look in the scripture, your financial life is not successful and you've not reached financial destiny until there is leftover. God says these words in Proverbs 13 with number, with number 22. It says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. I want, to, I want to think of that. That's the kind of assignment that God's given to me. Praise God. In other words, I am not supposed to die until I leave enough for my children's children to inherit. That is the agenda of God. That is the principle of God. You are not financially successful. You have not reached your economic destiny until you have leftover that your descendants, your grandchildren will feel and experience. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. That's why people work hard. You meet somebody at 65 years old. You're wondering, what are you doing? You are not far from going out of this life and you've got enough. As he said, he keeps on fighting. Why? Because he's trying to make sure that he establishes something for the grandchildren. Because the principle of God is a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Proverbs 19, verse number 14, the Bible says, The houses and wealth are inherited from parents. Hallelujah. So you have reached your economic destiny, financial destiny, when you have enough left over for the next generation. Hallelujah. Your destiny journey is successful when you live out your years. Anything that snuffs your life off before your, your lifetime is over can snuff your child's life off before their lifetime is over. Is that making sense to somebody? And you get what I'm saying? That's why people fight to stay alive. That's why you fight to make sure that all your days are fulfilled. That if God gave you 90 years, you want to make sure that you live through 90 years. Because you're handing over to somebody long life. Don't allow anybody to lie to you. Everything that happens in the previous generation always reaches out of the next generation. I'm going to show you that in the Bible. There's so many people that will tell you that you don't have to deal with anything in the past. But I'm going to tell you that that's all a lie. And I want you to listen to this. Never listen to just everybody. Not every preacher is sent to everybody. Did you get what I'm saying? There are people that are not sent to you. And if you listen to them, they will actually make your life's course come to a halt. There are people that are fine. There are people that are sixth generation of preachers. People that have nothing to break. You understand that right now as I'm talking to you, South Africa is free from apartheid. And a descendant that is born to Nelson Mandela is now free from apartheid. They don't experience apartheid. They were born to a South Africa that has no apartheid over it. But the reason is simple. The forefather broke the power of apartheid for his descendants. And there are people like that that are born into a family where your forefather was Nelson Mandela and he broke marital apartheid and he broke poverty apartheid and he broke all those kind of death apartheid. And so because of that, therefore, you're born into a generation where all these apartheid forces no longer exist. And you have nothing to break. When somebody like that talks to you, they will tell you, there's no apartheid. But wait, someone had to break it. Hallelujah. And if in your lineage, nobody broke it, you better stand up and break it. Because if you don't break it, it's going to break it. Did you get what I'm saying in it? Hallelujah. 
Not every preacher is sent to everybody. That's why you find in the Bible, in the book of Acts chapter number 16, you find a place where Paul is trying to go on preaching. He carries the message of God. And Paul tries to end up Thessalonica. The Spirit of God tells him, don't go there. Paul tries to enter Galatia. And the Bible says the Spirit of Christ does not allow him. He goes to a place called Messia. And the Spirit of God does not allow him to go there to preach. He carries a message. He knows that God's given him something. But God refuses that he should preach there. He goes to Bithynia. The Spirit of Christ does not allow him to preach there. And in the night, he sees a Macedonian man begging him, please come help us. When he wakes up, he knows God has sent him to Macedonia. Paul was carrying a message in the city of Bithynia. God did not allow him to minister to the Bithynians. If the Bithynians listened to Paul, they were listening to someone not sent for them. You getting what I'm saying? So you are not just somebody that is called not to listen to, to false preacher. You also have to choose who to listen to. Getting what I'm saying? There are people that are anointed of the Lord and they preach powerful messages that I wish I could actually preach like they are, but they can't bless me. I know there are people they're supposed to bless, but they can't bless me. Are getting what I'm saying? I'm not a preacher that you're blessed by just motivation. And there are people that just need a motivator. I come from hell itself. I need somebody that show me, shows me how to pour enough water on hell until the fire dies. Getting what I'm saying? That's where I came from. I need a message that will help me get to pull my roots out of hell and get to the place where my life can make sense. So I don't need somebody that motivates me and tells me all is fine. I don't need pampering message that would just pamper me and tell me it's okay, baby. No, no, no. It's not okay. I know that. Are you getting what I'm saying? You must know who to listen to. Whom God has sent as the arm of God stretched to you to raise you up. Don't just listen to everybody. The people that will tell you, quote a scripture in the Bible, Book of Jeremiah chapter number 18 where the Bible says the children will not die for their father's sin. Neither will the fathers die for their children's sin. That sounds very nice. But you need to ask who was to bring the death. You're talking about a situation where God had actually talked about a curse coming from God. And therefore the death was supposed to come from God. God was to judge the next generation for the sins of the fathers. And God says, now that is over. You understand what I'm saying? I am no longer going to judge the next generation for the sins of the fathers. But wait. But that is God. God's withdrawn that. Did Satan also withdraw that? Get the picture. You must understand what, where is what force coming from? And what is its source? And how can it be dealt with? Are you ready for this? Back to my point. Okay. We're talking about the fact that life is a journeying process. Life is given to you for free. Living is the process of experiencing life. It's the process of expressing the life. And it is a journeying process. Are you ready? You journey through development or growth. That's important, so begin to listen to me carefully. Journeying is through development process, through growth process. The journey of life is through development process, through growth process. It's through a building process. In other words, the human life is a building that is built. Human life is built. And every building has a foundation. And the foundation determines how the building is raised. The stature of the building. The longevity of the building. How stable the building is going to be is determined by foundation. Whether the building lives out its lifespan or not is determined by the foundation. Are you beginning to feel what I'm talking about in here? Your life is, your living process is a development process. You're being built. But that building has a foundation. Very, very important. All right? 
Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. The human living process is also a growing process. You are grown. You're not just built. You are grown. Again, it almost looks exactly like the life of a tree. Because as a tree has a seed or has a root that must be planted in the soil, so the human being comes from a root. And as a tree has fruit, it must bear, so the human being has fruit. Is that making sense? Praise God. And so the roots of the tree are the foundation. And always, I may forget to say this, and let me say it right now. The foundation presets destiny. The same way that the root presets fruits. If you understand botanic language and you understand plants, all right? I think that's the right word, botany. Is that true? Oh, learned friends. <laughs> Hallelujah. If you have good botanic language, then if somebody shows you the seed of a plant, you can tell what fruits to expect. Am I right? If you are able to read the DNA factors in the root of a plant, then when you look at the root of the plant, you can be able to foretell the fruit. Is that making sense? Now, that's the problem with me. And several times when I look at people and I see their foundation, I can tell where they're going in life. And several times people don't like me for that because you sound like a false prophet. Getting what I'm saying? When I look at your life and I see that you've come from broken marriage, then I can almost tell that you're actually going to a broken marriage unless something happens. And when you tell people that they don't like it, but I got to tell you, that's just having the ability to look at the root factors and the foundation factors. If you're a good builder and you're actually a real good builder, if somebody shows you the foundation of the building before he shows you the building itself, you can tell what kind of building is going to be. Am I right? If you are somebody that's a good plant farmer and somebody shows you the roots of, of a tree, you can tell what the fruits are going to be. That is how you need to begin to look at your foundation. Your foundation are your roots. And those roots carry potency for fruit. Very important. Right? And what better time to pay attention to this than now? Before you see fruits. See, one of the reasons why many young people are careless about their lives is because they, they have not borne fruit. You understand what I'm saying? They've not gone through marital pain. So they don't really think that beautiful as I am, really? Oh my goodness, anybody divorcing me? Oh, come on, boy, come to your sense. So at this stage, we look at our looks, we look at our handsome, we look, and we don't know that there are so many marriages of handsome folk that are broken. We don't know there are so many marriages of beautiful women, so pretty, that are broken. And several times they broke because the root was saying it should break. The breakage is fruit. But before the breakage, you have no fruit. So if you're not careful, you might never tell that there would be breakage. Am I speaking things you understand? Well, I'm speaking Greek. Thank you. Hallelujah. So you must understand that. You must come to the place where you understand that you journey through development process, through growing process. That's where foundation then becomes extremely important. You journey through racing. Life is a race. Mm, I love this bit. So sweet, I love it. Living is raising. Let me give you a scripture. In the book of Hebrews 12, verse number 1. The apostle that wrote that book says these words. He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. He's talking about the heroes of faith. Talking about the people like Abraham. Talking about the people like Enoch. People, people like Jacob that became Israel and stuff like that. He said, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Watch this. He said, therefore... Throw off every weight that hinders. That scripture should begin to sing something to you. He said, throw off every weight that hinders. In other words, the apostles say yes, that it's possible that you're in church, but there is a weight that can hinder. 
Then he says, and let us run the race marked out for us. So he tells us that living is racing. Hallelujah. Life is a race. Now you understand that racing is different from the just journeying. Because a race is a timed journeying process. Number two, a race is a journeying process that has a goal. You have gold, you have silver, you have bronze. Am I making sense? A race has pursuers, competitors, factors that are trying to overtake you so that they can have your gold. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you this. How fast you run is determined by what's chasing you. People that are so busy trying to get things right, it's just because they're cognizant of the things that are chasing them. That's what makes you you know, there are people that run so fast that even their muscles, their heart, their lungs could not take it. By the time they cross the finish line, they fainted. They have fainted. Somebody slammed off, gone, fainted. They can't see. You understand what I'm saying? They gave it so much because of what was pursuing them. In a race, if you do not know what is pursuing you, you can be careless. And when you hear echoes that living is racing, you want to be, begin to ask yourself, who is pursuing me? What is pursuing me? What is the goal that is at stake? Hallelujah. So it's a marital race. And some people, because they never had speed, because that's one of the factors of a race. Because some people didn't have speed because they were not aware of what was chasing them. <laughs> By the time they reach the finishing line, they find the gold has been taken. The gold husband. When you were starting the race of life, you had this kind of guy. This kind of guy. This is the man that I want to marry in life. Yet everything set out so beautifully. By the time you reach the finish line, you find that gold is gone. So you have the options of bronze or silver. For some people, you find gold has gone, silver has gone, you're left with bronze. Some people, by the time they come to the finish line, because they never were aware of what's chasing them, they found gold is gone, silver went, bronze is gone, no medal. So you walk away from the wedding platform with the man. You look in the eyes of this person when he's sleeping and you're wondering, where did you come from? Because this is somebody completely contrary to what you dreamt of. You dreamed of gold, but when you reached, gold was not there because gold was taken by factors that overtook you. You understand what I'm saying, don't you? You talk to people that are married. Talk to people that are married. Don't talk to young people all the time. You talk to some people that are married, they will tell you. Mm. <laughs> I, was <de> <laughs> I was dealing with somebody that had been married just for four months. Four! Four months! Since he read it, four! And the man is crying like a baby because in the same church is seeing the Rachel he should have married. And he's wondering, who brought Leah to my house? And the reason is simple. Something was racing against him and took Rachel to gold. All right? Something else came took silver. Something else came over, overtook him, took bronze. So now he is looking at someone that has no medal and is wondering, where are we going together? I have 70 years lined up before me to live. <laughs> and I have these things to fulfill in the course of my living process. Where are we going together? Are you getting what I'm saying? Yeah. Life is race. Life is race. I don't have the time to really get to tell you this, but even when you go to the marketplace where we build wealth, all the opportunities, by the way, wealth is transacted on the platform of opportunity. And opportunities are very dynamic. There are things that used to make sense that no longer make sense. Am I making sense to somebody? You become a telephone, um, a telephone trader whose product is landline. Then tell me how much money you make per day. <laughs> Yeah. 
There are even some mobile phones that used to be really loud in the marketplace that are no longer there. They used to be opportunity, they're no longer opportunity. That's how the marketplace is. And so when you're truly going to participate in the marketplace and you're going to make money, you're going to build wealth, you must have speed. Because opportunities are so dynamic that if you are this kind of sluggish, slow person that has all the time to buy, i got to tell you, you walk in when they've just walked out with everything. You wake up, go to the next market, and you walk in, you watch them walking out with everything. And at the end of the day, you think it doesn't work. But i got to tell you, there are people for whom it works because they got speed. They understand life is a race. And race is timed. Amen. Oh, let me pause there and just think. Young man listening to me right now. There is this girl that's meant for your wife. And God is building her. And in a short while, she's reaching her peak. Where God can't but give her away to the man of her dream. Are you building yourself too? Is it possible that when she's ripe, you are not? And would God still be this God that is so unfair but would still just give her you who are less? Could there be some kind of competitive process through which you need to build yourself so that you can be ready for somebody that's being peeled up by God for you? Life is a race. If you love sleep, God says don't love sleep or you will grow poor. If God says he's better pay attention. Nobody came here to sleep. By the way, people that are wise understand nobody comes here to sleep. Do you understand that children normally don't like sleep? You know what, what happens? Sleep is taught. We learn it. You never come here to sleep. Sleep is taught. Mama just gets to teach you, you know, we sing lullaby, you understand? Lull you understand? We sing nice lullaby. Some of them recorded on, on YouTube. Until you learn when the lullaby comes to go deep. Children protest. Every time they feel sleep, they cry. They cry so painfully. You wish you could keep them from what is coming. <laughs> they just send sleep, they begin to cry. Why? Because I was not born for this. And the problem is once you learn how to sleep, boy, you can do this job real good. Life is not meant for sleeping. Life is for function. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So you develop through racing. You journey through racing. I got to stop right here. If I don't, I'm going to take several hours of your day. Thank you. Anybody understanding what God is speaking to us? You got to begin to do a surgery into your life. This message is supposed to be a surgeon's knife. It's supposed to help you cut your life through and ask yourself, excuse me, what has been going on in my life? When will it stop? Who will stop it? You want to ask yourself, if what is going on now continued for 10 more years, what is the consequence? You're getting what I'm saying? If it continues... For the next 10 years, what is the consequence? Because everything grows. You understand? Everything in your life grows. Sickness grows if not attended to. Evil grows. If you don't pay attention to death and break its power, it grows. If you don't pay attention to some kind of stressful thing that is attacking your mind, it grows. It grows into depression. By the time people are depressed, they can tell you, I've struggled with mind things for so many years. By the time they give up and suddenly they get depressed, they have struggled with something that's been in their head for so long. You get it. So the question you want to ask yourself, could there be something that needs attention? And how will it be attended to? What's going to happen for it to get out of my life? Don't watch evil eating into your life. Don't watch something growing in your life that you clearly know God has not placed in my life. This is not God. You look at this experience, you know this is not God. This is not God. Hello. 
moment you're seeing something going on in your life, it's a process going on and you know it's not God. You want to ask yourself, could there be a root factor? Could there be a foundation? Because when we look at the foundation of factors, we're looking at the start factors. And in the journey of life, we're going to see that next week. In the journey of life, how you start is important. Is that making sense? It doesn't, it does, it doesn't matter how you start. It determines how you journey. It determines how you arrive at destination. There are people that are crying today in their marriage because of how they started the marital relationship. You start the marital relationship through fornication. That's how you have to sustain. How you start is important. Where you start is important. In the journey of life, where you start is important because it determines where you are going to end. In the journey of life, when you start is important. Am I making sense? You start 10 hours from the time you should have started, you are 10 hours late. Unless you get a build speed, you are going to arrive 10 hours late. Will there be a consequence? I'm going to tell you yes. If, for example, you get married 10, 10 hours later than you should have, it's possible your gold is gone. Time is important. Where? When? Hallelujah. Are you getting what I'm saying? We're going to see that next week. Beloved, you have the greatest advantage. The greatest. You have not made mistakes that are permanent marks you can't delete. I was dealing with a precious man who told me how he started his marriage. He was in a relationship with a lady that was just there. The lady had a child out of wedlock, and I'm not saying that a woman who has a child out of wedlock is not marriable. Please understand what I'm saying. And they were just having fun. You know, the way the people of the world just come together and just, just, let's, just let's just, you know, peck each other like chicken. You understand? Just... Where are you taking me? Nobody's asking any question. Where are you taking me with this and stuff like that? It doesn't matter. So they're just pecking each other and stuff like that. And then somewhere in the course of this relationship, then a friend of his has his sister visiting, his younger sister, and she visits him in the place of work, and he sees this friend's sister, and he likes her. And uh, he goes pecking, because he's used to pecking. Chicken that love pecking, just like pecking everyone. So, so he goes pecking with this girl as well, and uh, she gets pregnant immediately. Now, the people, the family of the girl say, you must marry our daughter. So for him, now listen to me carefully. For him to get to escape, he has to marry this other lady he had never wanted to marry, so that now the family of that girl can stop pursuing him. A few years down the line, he's crying like a baby. Because how you start things is important. In the journey of life, how you start is important. So we're going to go back to how your life was started. And by the way, you see this Bible? I've gone through this Bible 24 times. And I'm finishing the 25th round. And I'm aware you are redeemed. And I'm aware that if anyone is in Christ, a new creature, the old has gone, the new has come. I'm very conscious of that, even when I'm talking about the foundation. Very conscious. The problem is several times those scriptures can become shortcut. Because a lot of us never like things that involve work process. And yet Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Because God works it in, we work it out. Many of us don't like to work it out. We love shortcut it out. The reality is there's somebody crying right now because of how they started. Where they started, when they started. Into what direction you started. 
you realize into what direction you start the journey determines where you end. Praise God. All right, we're going to finish right now. Whoever you are watching right now, please just allow me to pray with you so I can release you. Father, I thank you for everybody that's watching. I pray that you may touch these lives. And I pray that as we begin to deal with the foundation of factors, that our soul is going to be blessed in a great way. And I pray, begin to cause a surgical procedure in the life of this person that's listening, that we can begin to judge everything that's going on in our lives. And we begin to ask ourselves, could this be related to a foundational factor? And I pray that you will speak to this life deeply in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord bless you. We're going to see you again next week. Father, I pray for every soul that is here present. I pray for these precious lives. Eternal God, I pray that you will grant, open our eyes. Open our eyes. Just, just, just speak to God, whatever you are. Just speak to God. Young people, don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. If you can shed off shame now, you will not be ashamed tomorrow. If you get it wrong in terms of marriage, you will be ashamed more then. But if you pray yourself out of negative marriage now, tomorrow you will be full of glory. Don't be ashamed when you pray. Don't be ashamed when you call upon the name of the Lord and you're saying, Lord, if there be anything that's wrong in my life, open my eyes. Cause me to see it. I want to see it. I want to see my foundation. I pray you open my eyes. Use this message as a surgery, as a surgeon's knife. Perform a surgical procedure in my life. Let me see the roots of my life. I'm beginning to see the fruits of my life. I want to see the roots that are causing this fruit in the name of Jesus Christ. And when somebody begins to pray, that prayer. God hears your cry and God begins to open your eyes and God begins to show you the negative foundation of factors that could be destructive and detrimental to your life and that's why you want to pray. You want to call upon the name of the Lord. You want to cry out to God Almighty. You want to say Lord help me that my eyes may see. Open my eyes in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father God, that every power of darkness and every evil going on in the lives of the young people here present and those that have been watching over Father, I pray, my God, that you may cause their lives to begin to see, their eyes will begin to see with the clarity that nobody under the sound of my voice will begin to entertain things that are patterns that are not of God, patterns that are not of God. I pray that you will help them, our Father, that they will not entertain patterns that are clearly not of God in their lives of a father. Sinful tendencies that are beginning to grip this generation. Immorality that is gripping this generation. Sexual thirst that is not of God. Sexual thirst that have come from hell that causes a generation to live in masturbation, to live in pornography. My God, I pray, let the fire of God begin to destroy such kind of thirst coming from the pit of hell in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, where somebody's life is inflamed with the desires that are not natural. Lord, I rebuke those powers of hell and I pray begin to raise them. Arouse the great giants of destiny. Oh God, that you will cause the destiny seed in the lives of these people to begin to germinate. Oh God, that the great leaders that they're called to be shall begin to develop. Dear Father, I pray the great husbands will begin to grow. The great husbands will grow. There will not be men that are stagnant. There will not be men that are stuck. There will be men with capacity to become great husband for the glory of God. I pray Father, the great wives are going to begin to develop. Their destinies will not be denied. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray Father that you may touch their financial life, their spiritual life. I pray Father that you grant them to begin to be aroused, to rise up, to develop, to grow up, to come to the place where they understand they are spiritual and they must fight. They must develop spiritual capacity to come to the place of spiritual destiny for the glory of God. I release your grace upon their lives. I release your grace. Come on, young person, talk to God. 
Talk to God. Talk to God. Talk to God. From the depth of your heart, talk to God. In the name of Jesus Christ, talk to God. It is your life. It is your life. There are mistakes parents have made. There are places where parents have failed you, but now it is your life. There are things your parent cannot correct. There are things your parent cannot change. There are things your parent cannot change. It is now your life. You have to adopt your life and begin to build it to the next level. You cannot afford to bank on the parental failure and allow yourself to fail too. Lift your voice and cry out. You don't want to fail your children the way your parent failed you. You don't want your children to be stuck the way your parents made you stuck. You got to rise up to the occasion and say, I'm going to build myself. I got to get to the place of destiny. I must break everything I need to break. Every shadow that is coming upon my life. Every generational pattern that I'm beginning to experience. I must rebuke it. I must fight it. I must uproot it from the root. Because my destiny cannot afford to fail in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to come to my destiny fullness and I refuse to be stuck in this life. In the name of Jesus Christ, just call upon the name of the Lord. Just call upon the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, just call upon the name of the Lord until your spirit begins to form. In the name of Jesus Christ, Raka Dalabose.